Our key verse, NIV, is then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. And as we can see uh, that we're picking up kind of where we left off last week, we've been studying in the book of Isaiah, the major prophet that uh, is really talking to the children of Israel and to us every day as we go through trials and tribulations and uh, ups and downs, and it let, he lets us know that God is there for us no matter what happens, he's there. And we're going to continue in the lesson today, starting with uh, the children of Israel uh, being kind of downhearted. Uh, and we all get downhearted sometimes, and sometimes we just don't. Uh, some, sometimes we, even though we have faith, our faith kind of drops a little bit, doesn't it? And we need some encouragement. Sometimes we have to encourage each other. But in today's lesson, we're going to see the children of Israel at a point. Well, they are kind of low, and we'll see some encouragement. And before I go any further, we'll uh, get Sister Michelle to read the verses. We only have five, so she's going to go ahead and read them all, and then we will all discuss it. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments, you will put them on like a bride. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people and those who devoured you will be far away. The children born doing your bereavement will yet say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Then you will say in your heart, who bore me these. I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left all alone, but these, where have they come from? This is to the sovereign Lord says, see, I will beckon to the nations. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. Kings will be your foster fathers and their queens, your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Thank you. Okay, and give a little bit more background. We'll remember that the children of Israel was in bondage in Babylon for 70 years. They had been in bondage because of their worshiping idol gods and doing different things, whatever they wanted to do, getting away from what God had told them to do. So as had been predicted, they were in bondage. And uh, then we come and the city had been destroyed. They've been taken away from home. But now, 70 years later, they would be rescued by the Syrians because they will overthrow the Babylonian nation. Uh, and under the Syrian rule is when they are returning home, they will be allowed to go home. But picture in our terms, they know what they were looking at in today's day. When a hurricane comes through or a storm comes through, or even the pictures you see on TV about Ukraine you're right now, it's devastating. So think about having to get up and look at that every morning when this place used to be very glorious, had a, a nice temple, you were living uh, what we call a good life. And all at once, every day, this is all you see. In other words, no hope. Now look at our society to, today, the different things that are happening with the government, local, national, uh, even things in our community, in our homes. So 
some natural things, even with the, the pandemic, you know, and we go through a lot of uh, bad times, what we call them, grievous times. And it's easy for us to tell someone else, it's gonna be all right. A God knows best, I just wait on the Lord. I used to kind of joke, so Lord, give me patience and hurry up. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that, that's the human side. We want everything instant. We're in an instant world. We like the microwaves and the air fryers, and, and they're great. <laughs> but and when the power goes out, we're like, oh, my goodness. You know, the, the power, the, oh, I left my phone at home. All these are new things that we have we've grown accustomed to. But wake up one day, and all that's gone. All of it's gone. Not only that, you look out the window and you see no, no green trees or hear birds singing. All you see is just devastation, ash and whatever. So think about what we've gone through. Even the pandemic, we lost loved ones. We lost jobs, friends, or, or church attendance. We couldn't come like we wanted to and all. So all these things were things that we took for granted that we would always have. But now the children of Israel is saying, okay, and Isaiah is speaking to them. And they are kind of grumbling. Forgot what God has done for you. You know, you're riding in a shiny car now and you complain about the price of gas. But you remember when you had to have the extra pair of shoes because the ones that you were wearing walking was dusty. Y'all don't know anything about that, do you? <laughs> we need, need to go back and do some history on what the people that came before us did, what they went through, what they sacrificed for us. But we are used to what we are, you know, luxury. We we'll call it luxury. And we complain, God had done so much for them, even though they had been in bondage all those years, they didn't think about why they were in bondage. Lord, rescue us. We need a renewal. But they needed a spiritual renewal, didn't they? They needed to get it right. He, didn't, he had rescued them time and time again, just like us. So, but we kept, they kept, on the complaint, forgetting. And sometimes the children didn't know anything about what had happened. That's why we have to teach our children. We have to pass information on. We need to remember our past, not to repeat some of it and to keep some of the things. We need to know where we came from. But the children of Israel are complaining. It looks bad. You know, it, it, it's very, very devastating. But they are assured that everything is going to be all right because God says so. They talk about, say, oh, well, there's not many of us. It's just a handful of us. What are we going to do? And in the beginning of this lesson, it's telling them, Oh, you will have many children when they talk about the bride and the ornaments and all. Well, Zion is referred to as the, the, the land, the people there. And they say, you will have many, the ornaments refers to the children. So this land is going to be repopulated. It's going to be populated to the point where your children are going to say, we don't have enough room. It's too crowded here. We need some more space. They can't see that because we're looking at the human side of it. Where are these people going to come from? We are scattered everywhere. Our children are not here. We went different places. And what does God do? It's going to be all right. All your children are going to come home. This land is going to be so full that it can't hold you. And how it's going to get here? People that have lost persecuted you, they're not going to be there anymore. And you're going to have kings and queens, these dignitaries, bowing down to you, and they're going to help you. 
Why? Why would they do that? Because it's in God's plan. That's what he planned. What we look at and depend on and what uh, God has in store for us is two different things. We think small. He thinks big. And it talks about how much does God love us? Well, we know he gave his only begotten son for us. But it gave the example of a mother hen or a bear, a mother bear or whatever, and say, God is a more loving parent than any of those. And I know one day I walked out my door and there was a commotion out there, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, but uh, it was a snake out there. I think it was the ones they call a black runner that kind of up on their tail and wiggling all around. Well, those birds was giving that snake a fit. Undoubtedly, there was a nest in that tree close by. And that snake disappeared. He was running for his life. Now, you would think it would have been the other way around. But God has a way of turning things around. And it's not always like we think it is. When you think you are at the, the end, there's no hope. You turn to God. That's what God wanted him to do. I'm going to fix this for you, but you got to know where your help comes from. And you got to be cleansed from inside. I'm going to beautify this land. I'm going to restore this land. You're going to have children. You're going to be populated so that this land is too small for you. I'm going to have to increase for you. But you have got, don't worry about the physical or the outside. I got that. I got your enemies. I want your spiritual side. I want you to turn to me. Have no other God before you. I'm talking and talking, Brother Eden. It's, it's, it's all about trust. Uh, so I'm going to tell a story. Uh, I remember, I can't, I think I was in the sixth grade. And my cousin, so if I'm in sixth grade, my cousin was in the seventh grade. We're on the school bus. There's some young ladies there. And we stayed in the rough side of town. So he said son to one of the girls. And one of the girls said son to him. And he said son back. So all I know, we get off the school bus and we finna fight. And I'm sitting there like, hey, what did you just say? And so we're not even at our stop. Basically surrounded by some neighborhood kids, finna fight. And I'm just like, how did this happen this quickly? So we get ready. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I can feel somebody grab me by my shoulder and pull me. And I look up, and it's my mom. And she's like, go. And I'm like, huh? And she's like, y'all go ahead. I'm going to take care of this. She said, go ahead and walk to the house. I'll catch up with you. And I'm like, huh? But mom, it's a point. And she's like, go. And so we went and walked on. Next thing you know, she caught up with us. And it was just like, Mom, you didn't need us to. I said, no, I got this. He said, I, I. and so it, it stuck to me. It was like, man, we're going to get our tails whooped right there. <laughs> but, but, and I'm like, when you think about it, line everything up. Why was she there? That was, We got dropped off away from my house. Like, I mean, half a mile away from my house. And she was right there. And that's the same thing with God. It's like, we, it's all about trust. And we think he's down the road at somebody else's house. And he's right there in the circle with you. Just wait and say, hold on. Hey, I got you. Go ahead and let me handle this. You're saying, Lord, come on in the house. And he's already there. He was there before you got there. He, he knows. And I can identify with that being a mother of three sons. I, I can think of a couple of times. <laughs> and now I look back and say, what were you thinking? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. right. Times have changed. But even though these times have changed, God is still in control. Yes. And that's a good point. If you all didn't hear her, she said, in these days and times, I would have been shocked. We got to bring our children, and it's not just children, it's adults. We got to have a kind, loving heart. Everything in these lessons, everything in the Bible that's there for us to 
to live better lives by looking at, these are not just nice stories with good ending or a long time, but these are things for us to live by, to understand how we are supposed to live and have faith and pass on to others. Things have changed a lot. God wants things to turn around. You think this lesson is just about the, the nation of Israel? Look at us. Look at us. It, it's, it's cute saying, and God bless America. Well, what is America doing? What does God have to do to get our attention? Why have things changed so? We need a cleansing. And he's going to take care of everything else. I th Sister Teacher, I think this pandemic is a prime example of how God will take care of you. Now, I can, I can kind of see when they're walking around in so many years, I can't stand to go to the same place. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like when you go on a cruise or when you go on a trip, you just, you just can't stand it. I've been in Jamaica so many times, they ought to know my name. I'm like, okay, I'm tired of this, so I stopped going. But to think of them walking around, all they had to do was obey. That's all they had to do. Obey God, get rid of the idols, you know, treat each other right. But no. So I just don't see it. I mean, if, if I did you wrong, let me know. And, and that says that, you know. And, and I'm going to try to rectify it. Well, are we now prisoners in our own homes? When you mention that, I think about you don't get up and go to the store early in the morning. You try to be at home by dark. And if you are out there, you don't want to make any stops. You don't, please don't go to the ATM at 10 o'clock at night. Don't go to the service station. You're prisoners in your own home. How many of you really feel safe walking out in your yard at night? Something has to change. The things that's happening now, just like God had to get their attention and they were in bondage for 70 years. We're in bondage. How do we turn it around? What do we do? What do we do? What do we contribute to it? to make this a better world? How do we go back to God? Don't clean up Tammy, James, or anyone else. Don't, don't, don't clean them up. Clean me up. And me is you. And if everybody clean me up, God has your attention. He said he will bless the faithful. So even the things that's happening around you, if you do the things that you're supposed to do, God is going to take care of your grief. He's going to take care of your finances. He's going to take care of all this. So all he wants is you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, on yesterday, I attended um, my mother's uh, Women Day program. And the speaker was talking about we women, we need to start wailing. And wailing, she was talking about praying to the Lord for our children and for our nation and for every, everything around us. So as women, we need to be asking and praying for, for the Lord for everything that's happening in this world. And we shouldn't be afraid to go anywhere. We shouldn't be afraid to step outside of our door. Have the faith that the Lord has got you covered and move forward. Just, yeah. He has you covered and he's giving you some, some common sense things to do. She's not saying don't just be reckless, don't lock your doors, or just, you know, don't invite trouble, but saying we should have peace inside that the Lord is going to take care of. All these things that's happening, it has happened before and it's been predicted, but wailing as praying, an honest, sincere, Prayer. You know, we had prayers that sound good and, and others are listening to, but one-on-one -on -one with God with a personal prayer 
apply. Well, what else? Hold up, Tammy, just a second. Tammy speaks loud, but uh, we are. I am a loud speaker. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we were taught in school to mm -hmm. speak up and speak loud. Right. But my thing, too, is like with the young adults and the youth, we see the drug dealers, we see the gangs, we see the fight. We got to get out and start going knocking door to door. And we got to ask God to help us to show us where we need. We're going to have to bring the people into the church. We're going to have to minister unto them on the outside so that they can come in and let them know that we weren't always perfect either. God have changed us. A lot of them, they beat themselves up with some things and they know who God is, but they need people to help them. But you can't lose yourself. And Satan put stuff out there to distract us. And when we get our focus from off of God, we lose and we get scared too. For all of us is not on the same level with our relationship with God. That, that's true. And we need to be patient with each other too. We, and we, we got don't to encourage need to be other. critical. We need to say, God wants everyone. Why is it taking so long? Because he has to work. He has more work to do on me. And he has some out there that don't have as good a relationship that I have with him. Some have better. We have to realize don't be comparing ourselves to one another, but get that relationship. And we have to go outside these walls. I can remember one of my sons being in trouble for where well, he missed curfew later. And anyway, he knew he was in trouble. So the next, his little buddies knew it too. So the next day, by the time we were up and I guess he figured we were gonna be having a little meet, we come as friends. I'm like, where are y'all going? Well, we know we in trouble, so we decide we come on and get it over with. I'm like, <laughs> he's in trouble. But they wanted guidance, so they wanted to hear the same thing because they were out there with him. And they want discipline. So they were going to take that discipline where they could get it from. So they came over to Sister Anderson, and they got it too. <laughs> but but uh, we have to be each other's keepers. We have to treat other people like we treat, uh, like we want to be treated. So we have to go out there where they are. Uh, missionary work, we say we're a missionary church. It's out there, it's out there. So think about what we need to do better. And uh, Sister Vanessa, we're gonna close out. I think our time is about up and she's gonna do the closing prayer for us. Dear Lord, we are thankful that hope built upon your word can never be crushed. Help us to focus on your purpose for our lives and to trust that you are in control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Closing statement. I know who holds tomorrow. Thank you all. May we stand for the opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in total praise this morning. We thank you for so many things. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our countless blessings. We thank you not only for the food we have to eat, but also for the spiritual gifts, Heavenly Father. We thank you for our health and our strength, a comfortable place to live, the beauty that surrounds us, and our spiritual wealth. I acknowledge you for the countless blessings that you have provided. I thank you for giving us clear direction through your holy word. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for being with us through the good times and the bad times. For it is during the bad times that we truly show our faith. Help us to see that we are blessed beyond measure. We pray for our children, protect and keep them safe in this sinful world that they live in. We pray for the, the, a safe life filled with the holy word. We pray for those going through bereavement. I pray that they turn to you for comfort, Heavenly Father. I pray for those stricken with any illness. I pray for the lost and alone and the poor in spirit. I pray that they turn to you for comfort and salvation. I pray for those soldiers serving on foreign soil. I pray that you lead them safely home. I pray for the country of Ukraine that peace may be delivered unto the land. 
I pray for those still lost in sin that they turn to you for deliverance. I pray for our telephone ministry that has touched so many people's lives since the coronavirus has been appeared. I pray all these things this morning in your marvelous son, Jesus Christ. Amen. First of all, let me wish happy Father's Day. You may be seated. And happy Juneteenth. Amen. Uh, we have Sister Deborah Brackford who's going to uh, enrich us on this Father's Day holiday, holiday celebration. Thank you, Brother Sawyer. Good morning, church. Good morning. We are here to continue celebrating for the weekend of Juneteenth. But on top of that, we have our Father's Day celebration. And just a little information about Father's Day. It wasn't always as um, celebrated as Mother's Day. In 1910, President Cal Calvin Coolidge, and then in the 60s, 1966, President Lyndon Johnson acknowledged Father's Day as a national holiday. And in 1972, that finally came to be, because I don't remember as a child celebrating Father's Day. But we always had to run and find a, a red rose on Mother's Day. So if your father is alive today, run and find a red rose to celebrate your father. And our father is a fantastic title to have. Only a few can elevate to the next level, which is daddy. We have many fathers and fewer daddies. Try to be a daddy, man. I challenge you to do that. A daddy is the, uh, the man in the family who reaches out, shows comfort, love, and provides for the family. All of those, God showed us how to do it as, his, as our creator. God created man. Then man became a husband. And the husband became a father. That is the order he wanted us to have it in. And that helps to keep the balance in our lives. So daddies, that's a fantastic title to have. That means that you are emotionally there. You are involved in your children's lives and in the life of your family. I um, had to go to school to find out uh, I had a father. I knew I had a daddy, but they said, who is your father? I said, daddy, <laughs> you know, that's something that's, I think that should be uh, highly expected uh, for most children when you're growing up. You don't hear somebody saying father, father, not a lot of families, there are some. But in my family, it was daddy. And my daddy was the man that I had to look up to, uh, to expect him to take care of us. And that's what he did. He gave us many whippings. <laughs> he told us what was right and wrong. And he showed us what was right and wrong. So men be daddies, in my opinion. And God has created this title for you. So please accept it and wear it well. Happy Father's Day to you all. We have gifts for you after service if you would like to come up to the table and get one of the gifts for all fathers. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Hey. Amen. We thank, thank Sister Deborah for that tribute to fathers today. Uh, that this time, I believe we got a congregation of him.
Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning will come from Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, of his past. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to our generations. Morning, everyone. Let us uh, bow our heads in a word of prayer. <laughs> Precious Lord, we thank you, dear Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us, dear God. We thank you, dear God, for all the many blessings that you've showered down upon us, uh, despite what we see around us uh, that calls us us to be concerned uh, so often, uh, dear Lord, when we see uh, violence that's around, when we see our country uh, in turmoil, when we see the world in turmoil, dear God, we uh, sometimes despair and we're concerned, dear Lord, but we take solace in the fact, dear Lord, that we know that you have the last word. We know that whatever the problem, we know that you have the answer. And we pray to God that you will help us in any unbelief that we may have, dear God, that it's, it's not so. We just pray to the Lord that you would just continue to be with us, that you would guide us, and that you will lead us on in the path of righteousness, dear Lord, for your name's sake. We pray to God that you will continue to bless our families, dear God, that you will continue to bless this church, that you will continue to bless, uh, bless the, our leader, and his family, every deacon, every mother, yes. every church member, yes. and every family that's represented here, the Lord, and furthermore, every church door that stands in your name. We pray to God that you will bless us and guide us and help us, dear God, each one of us, to be a manifestation of who you are. Help us, dear Lord, to not only be Christians and uh, be uh, daddies and good husbands and sons, uh, children to the people that, uh, that are right around us, that are right in our midst, but help us, dear God, to be an extension of you uh, to society as a whole. Guide us and help us and put us in a position, dear Lord, to touch the lives of some people, dear God, who don't know you. Help us, dear God, to be an example so that they will want to have what we have, that there'll be something special in us that they see that they will desire so that this world can be turned around. Help us, dear God, to, to be the people, dear God, to, to change this world the way that you would want it to be. Help us to be uh, the instruments of change. Dear God, we just pray to God you continue to bless us and uh, help us on this Father's Day. Help us as we celebrate Juneteenth. Uh, but not, dear God, just as a day uh, to be off and a day to have fun and celebrate. Help us to understand the true meaning of what it, of what it is. Help us, dear God, to understand so that we can teach our children. Help us to understand, dear God, so we won't, won't make the mistakes of the past. We just ask you, dear God, in every endeavor in, in, in our lives, be with us and guide us and order our steps, oh Lord. Help us, dear God, to help those that are in, in, in need, whether that they, these are people in prison, whether these are people that's having problems uh, with health issues, uh, whatever it is, dear God, help us, dear God, to be your ambassadors for love and truth and peace. We ask, dear God, you continue to Watch over us, gather us, and show us the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 At this time, we have a song by our male choir.
have a hymn that we're going to be, we've come this far by the faith. It's on page 565, oh, I'm sorry, 529 in the hymn. inspirational song. Next, we will have uh, acknowledgments. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Daddy's Day again to all of our fathers and all of our father figures. And happy Juneteenth. I have a few announcements that were sent by Mrs. Minter. Um, in regards to our um, leadership for the Hines County Congress of Christian Education, as well as the National Baptist Congress of Christian Education, will be June the 21st through the 24th here in Jackson. And it says that it will take place at the Convention Center here in Jackson. And also, let's be in support of the Hines County Congress of Christian Education. 
some of our youth will be performing and Noah Eatman will be speaking on Monday night at 7.30 p.m. This is the Hines County Congress of Christian Education annual session, which will be June the 27th and the 28th, 6 p.m. nightly. And it will be held at St. Thomas MB Church in Bolton, Mississippi. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen, and we thank Sister Moore so much for that. And also acknowledgement, uh, some of the sick, Sister Velma Funches, Sister Leona Taplin, Sister Shirley Miller, Sister Jessica Turner, Sister Jennifer Davis and family, the Wilkerson family, the shooting in churches and schools, and a special prayer for our pastor and his family that is traveling at this time, Sister Maggie Crudup and Sister Shirley Hewitt. And we also include all those that are sick and shut in the weak and poor in spirit. We pray for them, that the Lord touch healing hands and heal them. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Next, we have something we all can participate. Well, let's see. Now, next, we have uh, another song by the male choir. Is that right? Okay, we can have a, uh, okay, it's just my, uh, my instructions here is, uh, but we'll have a, uh, we have tithes and offering at this time then, and then after that we'll have the mail choir. Okay.
Heavenly Father, we honor you. We praise you this morning with these gifts, Father God, that we give back unto you, just a portion of what you have already given to each of us. Praying that you would bless it and sanctify, Father God, that it may be used according to your will and purpose on how you see fit. Bless those that gave and those who wanted to give but did not have for whatever reason it may be. Continue to be with us and guide us, Father God, according to your will and purpose. We ask and pray. In the majesty, master's name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Next, we have a song by our male choir. Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> Sister, uh, uh, Sister Deborah, what she said about the gathering, you know, we, uh, you know, we appreciate them tube socks and tighter white that y'all you know, always get us every year. Uh, appreciate y'all. I, I was at Walmart yesterday and there wasn't nobody in the parking lot. I was like, yeah, I leave for Mother's Day, it'd be jam. <laughs> But you know, you know, but we we gonna we're gonna be all right, guys. You know, we're gonna hold up the fist and we're gonna keep moving Amen. on. Amen. Because this song that we're about to sing right now is, is what's what most important is that he didn't have to wake me this morning. All right, so let's put our hands together and sing this all together. Lord, you didn't have to wake me soon this morning, but you did, Lord. I know you didn't have to wake me soon this morning, but you did, Lord. I know you didn't have to wake me early this morning, but you did, Lord. And I'm glad about it. You didn't have to wake me soon this morning, but you, that ain't all you done for me. You woke me up early this morning. Lord, you were right on time. Had my health and strength and clothes in my right mind. You didn't have to wake me soon this morning, but you ain't got to ask you. You didn't have to wake me soon this morning, but you I wonder if anybody else here tell him you didn't have to wake me early this morning, but you I'm so glad, Lord, you didn't have to wake me soon this morning, but you that ain't all you done for me. You woke me up early this morning. Lord, you were right on time. Had my health and strength and clothes in my right mind. You didn't have to wake me this morning. You didn't have to wake me this morning. Didn't have to do it. I'm so glad you did. You all ought to take time out and tell him thank you. I know you didn't have to wake me soon this morning. You didn't have to wake me this morning. 
You didn't have to wake me soon this morning. You didn't have to wake me this morning. You didn't have to wake me soon this morning. You didn't have to wake me this morning. Amen. 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 We thank our male choir. Next, we'll have the hymn of Amazing Grace, page 161 in your hymn books. was grace that taught my heart. Scripture this morning be come from John 6, 16 through 21. And I'll be reading from the New Life Translation. You may be seated. John 6, 16 through And it reads, that evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Caprion. Soon a gale, soon a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three the four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat and immediately they arrived at their destination. The subject is encouraging faith. And, and, and you know what church? Just think about it. When a, when a person is born again, they're like a newborn baby, right? The disciples was really, really no different. They had had a lot of growing to do in just a short period of time. And, and although all through the gospels, Jesus grew them and he nurtured them. We all know what happens when a person is born again, right? We know. The very instant that we're born again, we automatically fully mature as Christians, right? We, we, we are able to handle anything the devil and the world has to throw at us, right? We have all the wisdom, experience, and knowledge that we need, right? Can I get an amen for that? Amen? Of course not. No. No. When we're born again, like them, we start off as just like a newborn baby. They start off very helpless and, and, and completely dependent. 
depended on the hovering, loving, nurturing protection of the one who gave him life. The disciples were really no different. They had a lot of growing up to do in just a short period of time. It wasn't too long before our passage this morning that they, they first began to follow Jesus. But all through the gospel, Jesus grew them. He nurtured them, he encouraged them, and, and he taught them. But he didn't, he didn't keep them as newborn babies. He purposely put them in situations situations that will grow their faith. And as they passed those tests, the faith grew. Sometimes the faith grew more when they failed the test. And you know, it's in our hard times in our life that our faith is truly tested, right? Our passage this morning is the fifth sign that John records. Matthew and Mark also recorded it, but they added some details that John doesn't include. We can combine all three accounts to come up with a fuller historical account. And we will do some of that. But John's purpose wasn't to give us a complete detailed historical account. With all history in the Bible, it is it, it's completely accurate and true, all history in the Bible. But, but, but he doesn't record every detail because that wasn't his purpose. I believe John's purpose in recording his sign is, is the same as his purpose for writing his gospel. His purpose is to show us that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that we might believe in him, and that when we believe in him, he will have, we would have life through his name. That's John's purpose for writing his gospel. And that's his purpose in recording this sign. Now, by signs, I mean miracles. This sign shows that Jesus is God because he has complete control, control over the universe that he created. When we combine the accounts of this event in Matthew, Mark, and John, we can see that there were three actual, there, there was actually four miracles that took place there. First, Jesus walked on water. Yes, he did. Now, I don't know if you ever tried to walk on water, but if you have, you might quickly realize that that's almost impossible to do. You know, I heard about a set of commentaries written by a, name, a man named William Barclay in the 50s. The problem was he didn't believe in miracles, so he spent most of his commentaries explaining away the miracles. Now, in his comments on this passage, he said that Jesus really didn't walk on the water. No, no. Uh -uh. The disciples were just rowing their boats really close to the shore. Jesus was walking on the shore, and, and, and because it was dark and stormy, they just thought he looked like he was walking on water. Now, what do you think of that? In my opinion, that's just plain silly. The fact is that Jesus defied the laws of gravity that, that he created in the first place. Jesus walked on water, but not only did Jesus walk on water, in Matthew 14, 28 through 30, in the new uh, in NIV version, record that Jesus called Peter out of the boat to walk on the water too. And as long as Peter kept his eyes, his eyes on Jesus and not those waves, he was able to miraculously walk on the water too. Now, that was the second miracle that happened there. Matthew and Mark both record the third miracle. When Jesus and Peter got back into the boat, the winds immediately, they stopped. It was such a sudden change that Mark 6, 51 says that they were totally amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder. This wasn't just a, a slight change in weather. It was instantaneous. Immediately from gale force winds to calm waters. There was no doubt in their mind that another miracle that happened. But one more happened too. John is the only one that records this one. We just read it in verse 21. Look at it again. Then they willingly received him unto the ship and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Remember how far verse 19 says they had rolled three to four miles. 
The disciple has been rowing most of the night in horrible winds, probably about nine hours, and had only gotten that far. And that was not even halfway where they wanted to go. And as soon as Jesus got on the boat, the wind immediately stopped. And they didn't have to row anymore. They didn't have to row anymore because they immediately was where they were going. Another obvious miracle. Four in a row, unmistakable, unexplainable, unquestioned miracle. Now, the question is why? Why did Jesus go through all of that? There wasn't a crowd of people watching. No, no. The only unbeliever around was probably Judas. The other 11 were already believers. Jesus wasn't trying to convince them to believe. So why did he perform this great sign? Why? Because Jesus knew that his disciples were newborn. They were newborn who needed to grow in their faith. Okay. In Mark 6, 51, 52 account, after he says that the disciples was totally amazed or they, they didn't understand, understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves for their heart was hardened. Remember that they had just witnessed Jesus. Jesus feed 15 to 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish but their faith was still, still small. Jesus knew that it, 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 it needed to grow to be encouraged. So Jesus encouraged their faith the best way that it can be encouraged. He encouraged it in a test. And he does the same thing to us. He does. Just think, how does Jesus encourage us our faith? The same way he did the disciples. He puts them in the right place. He prepares them for the right position, and he presents them with the right person. First, Jesus encourages our faith by putting us in the right place. Think about where Jesus and the disciples had just been. They had just been on a hillside, a hillside next to the Sea of Galilee. Thousands of people were happy and, 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 and as they could possibly be. They were ready to make Jesus their king because he had just fed them. Now think about it. Think about the disciples in the disciples' perspective. They were full too. They were happy and they were superstars. They were Jesus' inner group and Jesus was a hit. They could puff out their chest and, and be a little bit more and say, I'm with him. And then what did Jesus do? What did he do? He ran them off. The King James Version says Jesus, Mark says that Jesus sent them, the people away. Matthew said Jesus sent the multitudes away. Jesus ran off the fan club. He then ran the disciples off too. Matthew and Mark used the identical words. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get onto the ship. Now, church, the word constraint is every bit as harsh as it sounds. It carries the idea of compelling or even forcing someone to do something that they really don't want to do. Jesus ran off the fan club. He forced the disciples to get onto the boat to head to the other side. And he made them go by themselves. As a matter of fact, that's probably the reason, the main reason that they were so adamant about not wanting to go. The text doesn't explicitly say, but I'm sure that they were not wanting to leave without taking Jesus with them. But that that's just shows how much their faith needed to grow. Because Jesus was putting them exactly where he wanted them. He was deliberately putting them in the exact right place at the exact right time. Do you think for a minute, a minute that the creator of the universe didn't know there was a storm coming? After the disciples rolled away out of sight and that storm came up, do you think for a minute that Jesus stood there wondering how I'm going to help them? Of course not. Jesus put the disciples in the exact right place at the exact right time where they needed, where they needed to be in order to encourage and grow their faith. He put them alone 
away from the glare of popularity to grow their faith. He put them in a fragile boat on horrible stormy seas to grow their faith. Notice that Jesus put them in a stormy sea instead of on top of a peaceful mountaintop to grow their faith. Jesus put the disciples exactly where they needed to be. Just like he puts us exactly where we need to be to grow our faith. No matter what you're going through, you are in the exact right place. Jesus wants to grow your faith. Just like he did the disciples. Jesus will encourage your faith by putting you in the right place. He will also prepare you for the right position also. Jesus encourages our faith by preparing us for the right position. Now, just a minute ago when I said that Jesus compelled the disciples to get into the boat, I want us to get a clear picture of that. Make no mistake about it. They didn't want to go. But as I said, I think that it was mainly because they didn't want to leave without Jesus. But Jesus compelled them, so they went. In other words, Jesus commanded, and they obeyed his command. And what was his command? Jesus tells Matthew tells that Jesus told them to go before him onto the other side. Mark feels Jesus command out a little more. He records that Jesus said, get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. Jesus gave them very clear instruction. Not only did he, not only did he tell them to get into the boat, he told them exactly what he wanted them to do once they got in it. He told them, to make their way across the sea of Bethsaida, which is toward Capernaum. His instructions was clear, concise, and to the point. Uh -huh. There was no misunderstanding what Jesus wanted them to do. As their master, Jesus gave the disciples a command, and they obeyed. When did they obey? When they got into the boat, even when they didn't want to. They obeyed even when Jesus didn't fully, fully explain where and when and how that he was going to meet up with them again. They obeyed even when the future wasn't clear at all. And do you know what else they obeyed even when it got really difficult, really rough? They obeyed even when it would have been a whole lot easier to turn back. They obeyed even when it seemed like they were getting nowhere. They obeyed even when every fiber of their being ached with pain and frustration. They obeyed and kept rolling. They rolled nearly all night long against some terrible headwinds, and they got no further than three and a half miles. All night long, and, 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 and they weren't even halfway. But Jesus told them to go, and Jesus was Lord and their master, so they kept rolling. The present made no sense. The future was completely unclear. But Jesus gave a command, and they were going to obey his command. Whatever the cost, wherever you are, Jesus is encouraging our faith by putting us in the right place. But he's also encouraging our faith by preparing us for the right position. And that position is the place where we recognize him as our Lord and Savior. He commands we obey, whatever the cost. But what if, what if he calls me to, a, to be a, a foreign missionary preacher? What if he calls me to full-time Christian service? What if he calls me to start a new ministry in the church? What if he calls me to start a Bible study for my neighborhood in my home? What if he calls me to increase my financial giving? What if he calls me to, 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 well, you fill in the blank. Jesus will encourage our faith by preparing us for the right position. Why is it called faith? Because when he calls you to a position of obedience, it won't always make sense. You will rarely prepare for it, and you definitely won't be able to see how it's all going to turn out. But that's how your faith and our faith will grow. That's how Jesus will encourage your faith. He will put you in the right place and prepare you for the right position. He will also present you with the right person also. Jesus encourages faith by presenting you with the right person. I want you to take a picture 
uh, 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 the scene of that scene in your mind. The disciples straining on them oars against that awful headwind all night long. Matthew says the wind was contrary. The word means it was in their face the whole time. Their muscles were throbbing and their bodies ached from physical exertion. Tears and everything else running down their face from the sea sprays and rain biting to the skin. And then out in a distance, one of them notices something. They couldn't exactly tell what it was, but it was coming on them very quickly. In their exhaustion, Matthew and Mark say that they thought it, they were seeing a ghost. They panic and crowd out in fear, but notice what Jesus did. Notice what he did. As they were panicking, Jesus spoke to them. Now, the text doesn't say, but I don't believe that he had to shout at them. The disciples were his sheep. And in John 10, 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And do you know what Jesus told them in a voice that they could hear? He said, I am God. In verse 20, Jesus says, it is I, be not afraid. It is I come from the only two Greek words, ego, I'm not. Do you know what they literally mean? Ego, I'm not literally means I am. Does that sound familiar? It should. Do you remember way, way back in the Old Testament when God was speaking to Moses out of the burning bush? When God told Moses, tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Moses asked God, who shall I tell them something? Do you remember what God said? He said, tell them I am sent you. In Hebrew, I am translates into Yahweh, sometimes pronounced Jehovah. If Jesus was speaking in Hebrew, which he probably was, when he spoke to disciples that day, he said, Yahweh, be not afraid. Don't be afraid because I am God. I am the one who created this wind and this water. I am the one who created you. And as your creator and sustainer, I'm telling you, to fear not. And notice what the disciples did in verse 21. They willingly received Jesus unto the boat. As, John, as James 4, 8 says, they drew near to God and he drew near to them. Jesus grew their faith by presenting them with the right person. And they invited their creator, sustainer, and Lord and master to be with them. And when they were in the presence of Jesus, they was no longer afraid. There was no longer turmoil. They was no longer pointlessly straining at them oars. After willingly receiving the Savior and Lord and Master, they were at peace. So how is our faith this morning? Have we willingly received Jesus unto our life as our Lord and Savior? It really doesn't matter. It, 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 it doesn't matter what kind of storm we might be going through today. It really doesn't matter. We can search and search, and we will never find peace outside of him. We can chase, pursue, earn, buy, and play all we want to. But none of those things will speak to us in our storm and say, be not afraid. Only Jesus can do that. And he will if you are willingly receive him. Now, maybe we have already received Jesus as our Savior. Maybe we have. But for some reason, we're failing to obey him in something. His commands aren't very complicated. His word is very clear about what Jesus commands. He commands obedience. Yes, he does. For the disciples, it was going across the Sea of Galilee. No matter what it took or how it didn't make sense or what the outcome might be. Now, I don't know what it is for you, it might be a commitment to service. It might be a commitment to giving. It might be a commitment to ministry or teaching. I don't know, but you do. Yes, you do. Jesus had prepared that position for you, and all he's asking is simple obedience. He put it in you. He put in you. You're in the right place this morning. He presents you with the right person this morning, and he's prepared you for the right position this morning. Will you just follow him? following simple obedience this morning. The word tells us that he would never leave us or never forsake us. 
So keep faith in him. To God be the glory. The doors of the church are now open. closer to Jesus. He will put you in the right place this morning. And he will present you with the right person. And he will put you in the right position to worship and praise his holy name. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in total praise, we're thankful for you for touching our bodies this morning and letting us see another day so we can worship and praise your holy name, giving us another chance to turn to you for all things that we need in this life. And we believe in you, Heavenly Father, that you will be there for us, but you said you would never leave us or forsake us. And we claim it in Jesus' name right now. I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice that you touch them and their families this morning. This Father's Day, Heavenly Father, and a special uh, day for us also is Juneteenth, as we celebrate many things. Freedom, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we pray for all churches in this community and around the world. We even send a special prayer out to our pastor who is away at this time, protect and keep his family, Heavenly Father. We pray all these things, in your marvelous son, Jesus Christ. And we, we, most of all, we're thankful for the blood you shed for us on Calvary Cross this morning, Heavenly Father. Hung, bled, and died for our sin. So that one day, when we sung our last song, when we walked our last mile, and when we prayed our last prayer here on this earth, we'll be with you in that glorious place called heaven. It is in your marvelous son, Jesus Christ, we say, Amen. Father, be with us as we leave this place, Heavenly Father. 
as we keep you in our mind continuously and as we follow your holy word in obedience. To God be the glory forever and ever. 